1885, quote, It is very painful to hear scholars who should know better, affirming the absolute perfection, the infallible accuracy, of our Bible. End quote. Rufus Phineas Stebbins, Carlton Albert Staples, A Common Sense View of the Books of the Old Testament, Unitarian Sunday School Society, 1885. 1885. Quote. Some persons regarded our English Bible with such superstitious reverence that they were opposed to any modifications of its phraseology. End quote. The Unitarian Review, Volume 24, 1885. 1886. Quote. Multitudes of pious but ignorant people in our own country and in England, until very recently, regarded King James Version with a reverence due only to inspiration. Charles Force Deems, Christian Thought, Volume 1, 1886. John 7 48 and 49. Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. 1886, quote. There is doubtless a considerable body of opinion opposed to any change in that authorized version of Holy Scripture which men have been accustomed from their childhood to receive as the Word of God. End quote. Annie Wood Besant, Our Corner, Volume 7-8, 1886. Annie Besant was the successor to Blavatsky in the Theosophist Society, i.e. New Age, Lucifer Worshipping and Doctrine. The Theosophists, such as Besant, often objected to the A.V., and promoted the readings of the R.V. 1886, quote. One objection made by plaintiffs, to the use of the Bible in the schools under defendants' control, is that they use the Protestant or King James Version. The plaintiffs are members of the Roman Catholic Church. On the other hand, the defendants deny that the translation of the Holy Bible known as the King James Version is incorrect, unauthorized or sectarian, or that any inspired portion of the Word of God has been omitted or excluded from the said Bible, they maintain and aver that the King James Version, is nearer the original writings through which the Deity has revealed Himself to man than any other translation. End quote. The Chester County Reports, Volume 2, Pennsylvania, Supreme Court, 1886. 1887. Quote. And the remarkable dictum of Chillingworth, that the Bible, and the Bible only, is the religion of Protestants, coupled with the grotesque idea of the verbal inspiration of the English version. End quote. John William Horsley, Jottings from Jail, 1887. 1887. Quote. The light cast on a subject which is more likely to be rightly understood by calm scholars than by the adherents of sex, who worship the letter of King James's version. End quote. The Critic, Volume 8. 1887. Psalms 119.11 and 105. Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. 1887. Quote. This unfaithfulness to truth is certainly not so great a sin against the light as the habit which seems to be still prevalent of treating the old authorized version alone as the ipsissima verba, i.e. very words, of inspiration. Let us hope that the increasing use of the new revision may win over its readers to the true standpoint and to right practice. End quote. James Frederick McCurdy, quoted in, William Rainey Harper, The Old Testament Student, Volume 6, 1887. McCurdy, 1847-1935, was a modernist, i.e. one who denies the fundamentals of the faith. Quote. James Frederick McCurdy entered Princeton Seminary in 1868 to study Biblical languages. He taught there 1871 to 1882, but resigned when his modernist views on the Bible were attacked. After studying in Germany he was hired by the University of Toronto in 1885. End quote. John S. Moyer, Called to Witness, Profiles of Canadian Presbyterians, Volume 3, 1991. 1888. Quote, there are so-called evangelists, and some ministers, who have forgotten their Hebrew and Greek, who scorn the biblical training of theological seminaries, and who think that the English Bible is good enough for them. They think that they have the key to unlock its treasures that Greek and Hebrew professors have not found. End quote. The Presbyterian Review, Volume 10, 
edited by Charles Augustus Briggs, 1888. 1888, quote. The theory is put by a distinguished dignitary of the Church of England in very strong form. According to him, quote. Every chapter, every verse, every sentence, every word is absolutely inspired by God, end quote. This is the idea of verbal inspiration followed out to its ultimate issue. They talk of their English Bible as though it were the original of the divine message. The story of the good divine who, being confronted by an objection from some of his hearers that the interpretation which he had given to his text was not in accordance with the original Greek, naively answered that, the gospel was always foolishness to the Greeks, is only an extreme illustration of the spirit in which some men indulge, and which not unfrequently found more or less distinct expression in the discussions which arose relative to the revised version. What special claim King James's translators possessed, that they should be regarded as specially qualified by God for the work that they undertook, that they had been inspired of God. But it is nothing less than this which is claimed on their behalf. There may be those to whom matters like this constitute no difficulty. They have been accustomed to regard every word of scripture as of equal authority. They shrink from dealing with their writings as they would with any other productions of human literature. To them the Bible occupies a position absolutely unique. None of its statements are to be challenged, no features of its composition to be minutely examined. Biblical criticism is in their view, therefore, little more than an act of daring sacrilege, full of menace to the highest interests of the soul itself. The scientific spirit, as applied to the Bible, savors of blasphemy and revolt. End quote. James Guinness Rogers, Present Day Religion and Theology, including a review of the downgrade, 1888. 1889, quote. We refer to the revised version of the New Testament. It cannot be made to supersede the old King James translation. It came with a great flourish of religious trumpets. For ten years it was in the hands of scholars said to be in every way exalted. When the work was done, the cry went up from orthodox lips that it marked a wonderful epoch in religious history. It was to fasten the attention of the world upon it, and thereby bring about such an upheaval as had never been known in all the long record of spiritual movements, uprisings and revivals. Multitudes of those who professed to be theologians and scriptural commentators praised it to the skies. The gudgeons were baited with an addition without a hell, and the new orthodox revolution, as far as any sort of an insight could be got from the surface, was an accomplished fact. Tabooed, spurned, a failure from the beginning, it has now passed almost completely out of sight and out of mind. And what is the reason for it all? Mr. John Fulton attempts to give the reason in the June number of the forum. He says in substance that too many changes were introduced to suit some and not enough to suit others. He also thinks that the poetry of many passages was impaired. Mr. John Fulton does not go deep enough. He does not get down to the real bone and sinew of the subject. The translated New Testament, or rather the revised edition of the New Testament, was the work of a lot of intellectual duds. They refined away poetry, pathos, rugged Saxon, quaint forms of expression, old landmarks, verses that had been lived and died by for centuries, old texts, old promises and old prophecies. One thing the people as a mass will never permit to have taken away from them, and that is the old-fashioned Bible. They never asked for any revision. They never for a moment considered that a revision was necessary. The old King James Version was venerated. Since its publication it has been a household book, the one sacred record of the births, marriages and deaths in a family for a generation. Its teachings had brought solace in sorrow. The common man is, only solicitous to know that it is his father's Bible, and that the refiners, the agnostics, the Tweedledum and Tweedledee fellows of the last half of the 19th century have not laid their hands upon that. Anchored fast to his old-fashioned Bible, even the very gates of Greek shall not prevail against his old-fashioned belief in fire and brimstone. End quote. J. Edwards, John N. Edwards, 1889. 1890, quote. That by reason thereof the King James Version of the Bible, only received as inspired and true by the Protestant religious sects, is regarded by the members of said Roman Catholic Church as contrary to the rights of conscience. End quote. The Weekly Wisconsin, March 22, 1890. 1890, quote. 
the practice of reading the King James Version of the Bible, commonly and only received as inspired and true by the Protestant religious sects. End quote. Decision of the Supreme Court of the State of Wisconsin relating to the reading of the Bible in public schools, 1890. 1890, quote. The critical prefer it, the revised version, but the people still cling to the King James Version. End quote. The Chautauquan, Volume 11, 1890. 1891, quote. Upon all such questions as inspiration, the deity of Christ, the atonement, an educated layman, with the English Bible in his hands, is just as capable, perhaps more so, of giving an intelligent opinion as a German critic. The critic has access to no sources of information shut out from the layman. All information possible on all such questions is within the four corners of our English Bible. End quote. The Theological Monthly, Volume 5, 1891. 1892, quote. Of course there were great difficulties in the way. There was the veneration and love which had gathered for so many years around the old version, and which regarded any attempt at revision with as much horror as the dissection of the body of some dear friend. A good man got up, and in a voice trembling with emotion, deprecated laying any hands on the sacred ark, i.e. the authorized version. The revisers, the revised version translators, who, with one exception, were all Trinitarians, declare unanimously that this celebrated passage, 1 John 5 7, is no part of the Bible at all, and like honest men they have ruthlessly cut it out. But what are we to say to those who assert that its omission makes no difference to Orthodox doctrine? It is the only text in the Bible which clearly states the doctrine of the Trinity, in no other place is it declared that these three are one, it is the one unmistakable proof text from which thousands of sermons have been preached. The doctrine is only inferred from other texts, in no other place is it explicitly taught. Does it make no difference to the scripture proof of a doctrine that the one and only text which plainly declared it is now pronounced a forgery? It is only childishness and folly to say everything is as it was, and revision has made no difference. Our Baptist friends have been accustomed to justify their refusal of baptism to children, and their doctrine of believers' baptism only, by the requirement of Philip and the confession of faith on the part of the eunuch of Candace before his baptism, and Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart thou mayest, be baptized. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But now when the Baptist turns to the New Testament he cannot find his favorite passage, it has no place in the best manuscripts, and the revisers have expunged it as an interpolation. No other text so clearly upheld the Baptist position, and yet we are told that its excision leaves the question untouched. Our evangelical friends have for ages made much of the words, without shedding of blood is no remission. But is not their favorite doctrine shaken to its foundations by the new rendering of the whole verse? Or look at some of the well-known and often quoted proof texts of the doctrine of Christ's deity. Here is the famous one, God manifest in the flesh. The revisers tell us that the word God rests on no sufficient ancient evidence, but that the passage should read, He who was manifested in the flesh. Does this make no difference to the proof of the Godhead of Christ? It is a great difference. One striking proof text is now admitted to be no proof at all, having no bearing on the question. One other instance will suffice. Here are the words, hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. According to this rendering it was God who laid down his life for us and died on the cross, and in this sense it has been triumphantly used as proving that Christ is God. But how does this revised version run? Hereby know we love, because he laid down his life for us. The revised version is of great doctrinal significance. It tends to break down the rigidity of orthodoxy, and it justifies that liberal Christianity which we, in this place, hold and teach. We, at any rate, have every reason to be grateful. We, welcome with the deepest thankfulness the Bible which the revisers have placed in our hands. What are the people who have held the infallibility of the authorized version of the New Testament to say to the fact I mentioned last Sunday? that the revised version contains 36,000 changes? I have shown you that there is no Greek and no Hebrew text free from error, and that no two of those ancient manuscripts absolutely agree. End quote. Joseph Wood, The Bible, What It Is and Is Not, American Unitarian Association, 
1892. These words from this Unitarian, infidel, not only prove that many believed the infallibility of the King James Version in 1892, they also show the great use that infidels have made, and do make, of the new, revised versions. The revisers merely revived the ancient infidelity in modern times. They based their translations upon manuscripts that were long ago corrupted through the same unbelief, 2 Corinthians 2.17. By 1892, it was apparent that the sound warnings from decades earlier had proved true. Quote, the stronghold of the anti-revisionists is, that any interference with our Bible would unsettle men's faith, and give an advantage to infidelity. End quote. The Journal of Sacred Literature, Volume 3, 1849. 1893, quote, The King James Version was regarded by many as too sacred to admit of revision. In opposition to all this Alexander Campbell taught that the Bible, while an inspired volume, must be interpreted according to the same common sense rules which we apply to other literature. End quote. New Christian Quarterly, Volume 2, 1893. 1893, quote, Up to the latter end of the present century, it practically amounted, as we have seen, to the most rigid theory of verbal inspiration, an inspiration usually attributed by the people at large, and even sometimes by their ministers, to the authorized English version. End quote. John James Leas, Eyre, and Spottiswood, Principles of Biblical Criticism, 1893. 1894, quote, There is a class of ignorant people to whom the King James Version of the Bible is the inspired word of God in all its language. They regard a revision as a tampering with the sacred text, and as an essential profanation. The forms of language in which sacred truth has been presented to them are quite as sacred as the truth itself. To this class belong the bigoted fool who declared that the new revision would make more infidels than all the Bob Ingersolls in the world, simply by its admissions that there had been some mistakes in the English Bible hitherto preached to the world, we fear that there is a leaven of this kind of dishonesty pretty widely scattered throughout the church, a feeling, or a fear, at least, that the exact truth in a new revision will remove some of the props from under old dogmas that had become precious, or that are regarded as fundamental in their accepted schemes of belief. End quote. Harriet Merrick Hodge Plunkett, Josiah Gilbert Holland, 1894. Jude 110. But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally, as brute beasts. John 7 48 and 49. Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. 1895, quote. Was it, the A.V., not for every Protestant an absolute, infallible rule of faith? So this book, the infallible voice of God revealing his ways, this sole rule of faith for millions of Englishmen, and by which millions had lived and sworn and died during more than two centuries, had to be revised. It appears, then, that the King James Bible of some years ago has not been as most Protestants of necessity claimed for it, the pure, authentic, unadulterated word of God. And if not, what guarantee have we that the promiscuous body of recent translators, however learned, with all not inspired, have given us that pure, authentic, unadulterated word of God? So far Protestant revisions have done Catholics a service, thus demonstrating the correctness of the old Vulgate, but they have also led Protestants to reflect seriously, and to realize that the Bible-only principle is proved to be false and dangerous. End quote. Herman Joseph Hoyser, Chapters of Bible Study, 1895. Again, we see that Roman Catholics, like the Unitarians and other infidels, rejoiced when these so-called scholars attempted to replace the King James Version. However, they also gave us one more testimony to the vast number of Christians who considered the authorized version to be infallible. Quotes could be multiplied showing the praise that Catholics heaped upon the RV for justifying the readings in the Catholic versions, for example Cardinal Wiseman, Thomas S. Preston, the priest of St. Anne's Catholic Church in New York, Tobias Mullen, Bishop of Erie, Pennsylvania, etc. Even Dr. Benjamin Warfield admitted that the RV, etc., was largely a return to the Catholic Bible. Quote, a careful comparison of these new translations with the Remish Testament, shows them, 
in many instances, to be simply a return to this old, Catholic, version. End quote. Collection of Opinions and Reviews, Volume 2. 1896, quote, The public has long since weighed the revised version in the balances and found it wanting. They have turned away from the new with a conviction that it could be no substitute for that which still forms the moral and spiritual backbone of the English people. The authorized version is the outcome of faith and zeal that have never been excelled. How is this to be accounted for? After there, R.V., New Testament was issued, Chaska lighted upon an Arabic translation of Tatian's Diatessaron. This takes us back to the text of the year 150, and decides in favor of the authorized readings against those of the revised. Those preachers who confide in them, and who give their congregations the more correct reading, are not airing their knowledge but revealing their ignorance. End quote. Word and Work Magazine, quoted in The Truth, 1896. 1896, quote. I can imagine the indignation with which these radical suggestions will be read by people to whom the authorized version is sacrosanct and irreproachable. End quote. The Contemporary Review, Volume 69, 1896. Sacrosanct means, sacred, inviolable. Webster's, 1828. 1897, quote. At a recent meeting of the Methodist preachers in and around New York City, Dr. Buckley, editor of the Christian Advocate, in discussing a paper read by Dr. Curtis, took occasion to say that there were not four men in the room who believed in the infallibility of the English version of the scriptures. The statement being challenged, he called for a vote, but the meeting adjourned without its being taken. End quote. Andrew Edward Breen, A General and Critical Introduction to the Study of Holy Scripture, 1897. Quote. At a recent meeting of ministers at the Methodist headquarters, Boston, Massachusetts, Professor O.A. Curtis of Drew Seminary read a paper intended to combat the views of Reverend Lyman Abbott, that the Bible sometimes errs. Dr. Curtis skillfully and clearly maintained the infallibility of the Bible teachings. The transcript says, There were present 150 members of the clergy, and they all, with one exception, applauded his views. The exception was Dr. Buckley. The doctor is editor of the New York Christian Advocate. In replying to Professor Curtis, he said, I am sorry to disagree with my friend Curtis. I don't believe in the infallibility of the English version of the Bible, and I think there are scarcely four men in this meeting who do. There was immediately a chorus of protests. End quote. The Unitarian, Volume 12, 1897. Quote. Dr. James M. Buckley, editor of the Christian Advocate, in the discussing the paper afterward, said, I do not believe that there are four men present who believe absolutely in the infallibility of the English version of the Bible. There was a stir in the meeting. Before Dr. Buckley could continue his remarks, the Reverend J. N. Schaffer of Newburgh got to the floor and said, If you don't believe it, doctor, we can do without you. Do you believe it? Retorted Dr. Buckley. Yes, substantially, replied Mr. Schaffer. The incident would probably have ended here but for a proposition by Dr. Buckley to put the question to a vote of the meeting. The Reverend Dr. Francis H. Smith of the 7th Street Church, who was also present, said, quote, The discussion involved the authenticity of the translations more than anything else. Fifty years ago there were Christians who believed that everything about the Bible, down to the commas, was inspired. End quote. The New York Times, February 16, 1897. Quote. It may be that there are advanced professors in the University of Chicago who have their doubts about the infallibility of the English version of the Bible. But, if so, they keep their doubts to themselves. Even more surprising was than the remark, by Dr. Buckley, was the reception with which it was met. It seems clear, however, that there is a considerable number of Methodist ministers in New York and its neighborhood who do not believe absolutely in the infallibility of the English version of the Bible. Inasmuch, however, as the Bible is held up by all these ministers to their congregations as in some sense infallible, and as the English version is the only one the majority of their congregations ever read, it seems proper that they should explain in what sense they regard it as infallible, and what parts of it their congregations are at liberty to reject as uninspired. They are told to search the scriptures, 
which are infallible. If this infallibility is, in the belief of many Methodist ministers, only partial, it seems that they owe their people the duty of pointing out which are the fallible and therefore negligible parts. End quote. The New York Times, February 17, 1897. Quote. As one purpose for which this paper was founded is to take glad and thankful note of the progress of the world in liberal thought and deed. We call attention to the free manner in which the Methodists are at present tackling the question of the verbal inspiration of the Bible. Dr. James M. Buckley, editor of the Christian Advocate, tells his clerical brethren that the time has passed for holding to many of the old-fashioned notions as to the Bible. One of these is the belief in the infallibility of the English version. He does not quarrel as yet with the original text, but with the King James translation. End quote. The Pacific Unitarian, Volumes 4 to 5, 1895. Notice, there were some American liberals in 1897 that did not believe in the infallibility of the King James Version. But this certainly shows how many people, even ministers, did embrace the doctrine of its infallibility. It also shows how this doctrine was opposed by Unitarians, liberals, infidels, etc., as a barrier to what they deemed to be progress. But their progress is called in the Bible, the falling away in preparation for the coming of the Antichrist. 1897, quote, A remark of Joetz, Regis Professor of Greek at Oxford, on the work of the, RV, committee when it appeared is perhaps worth recording here. He stated, quote, They seem to have forgotten that, in a certain sense, the authorized version is more inspired than the original. End quote. Evelyn Abbott, Lewis Campbell, The Life and Letters of Benjamin Jowett, 1897. 1897, quote, The decided probability is that the King James Version will be the Bible, not only of this generation, but of several generations to come. End quote. Des Moines Daily News, October 27, 1897. 1897, quote, What, in truth, is inspiration? And in what sense and degree is the Bible an inspired book? Such are questions heard all around us, and the answers given range from a claim to a verbal inspiration, almost, of the King James Version. End quote. The Churchman, Volume 75, 1897. 1897, quote. A hundred years ago the authorized version, which had been in our father's hands for nearly 200 years, was no longer a version. It had come to have all the significance of an original book. Outside the pulpit and the university no one dreamed that it was translated from another language. When our fathers, as they did, stoutly maintained the doctrine of verbal inspiration, the inspired words they really had in mind were not Hebrew or Greek, but English words, the words of that version which Selden called the best translation in the world, and of which the late master of Balliol once remarked, in a certain sense, the authorized version is more inspired than the original. The Bible was read in those days, as it is not read now, it was committed to memory by the children, and trodden in by catechizing, as is not done now. Before long, interpreters, felt it increasingly necessary to make their own translation of the book on which they were commenting. All these things gradually wrought in the ordinary religious mind a feeling of unrest. If the foundations are destroyed, what will the righteous do? While the revised version stands on the library shelf as a much-valued commentary, the book that gathers the dog's ears, that is read and cherished as a closet companion, is still the venerable version of King James. Nor can I see signs of its displacement. Here is a book, the KJV, that is more than a version. A severe blow the theory of verbal inspiration had already received. The most obvious initial step too, making the Bible an ordinary book in people's minds, is to print the Bible like another book. A step toward this result was taken by the revised version by dividing into paragraphs instead of verses. End quote. Minutes of the Annual Meeting, General Association of the Congregational Churches of Massachusetts, 1897. 1898, quote. No pains were spared by the translators, and in 1611 they published that which has since been considered the greatest treasure of English literature, known to us as the authorized version of the Bible, which is still used by churchmen and nonconformists alike as the pure word of God. Many persons now, 
forgetting that all English versions are merely translations from the ancient Hebrew and Greek, imagine each word and letter of the 1611 translation to be inspired by God. End quote. Charles Arthur Lane, Illustrated Notes on English Church History, 1898. 1898, quote. And they even stretched the mantle of divine authority to cover the English words selected in making King James Version. End quote. Dr. Frank Crane, Is the Old Book True? 1898. 1898, quote. It is said of Bishop Lee, that he considered every word of the English authorized version inspired, and an absolute belief in it to be necessary to salvation, as in every particular weather history, chronology, geography, or physical science the book is infallibly accurate. This may seem an extravagant statement, but it represents a view held unconsciously by simple-minded, earnest, sincere Christians. End quote. Robert Needham Cust, Linguistic and Oriental Essays, 1898. 1 Corinthians 1.20 Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? 1898, quote. There are some who insist on the divine inspiration and they even stretch the mantle of divine authority to cover the English words selected in making King James Version. It is needless to say that I do not hope to allay this timid fear which is the child of ignorance. End quote. Our Day, Volume 17, Chicago, 1898. 1899, Quote, Thousands who have come to regard the very phrasing of the King James Version as sacrosanct. End quote. Record of Christian Work, Volume 18, 1899. 1899, Quote, We doubt whether any new translation, however learned, exact, or truly orthodox will ever appear to English Christians to be the real Bible. The language of the authorized version is the perfection of English, and it can never be written again. For the language of prose is one of the few things in which the English have really degenerated. Our tongue has lost its holiness. End quote. Ellis Yarnell, Wordsworth and the Coleridge's, with other memories, literary, and political, 1899. End of chapter 9.